is Ali Abdul Rashid, and uh, I'm originally from New York. Uh, I'm living now in uh, Florida. I was born in uh, Buffalo, New York, uh, 1955, and um, <clears throat> um, I come from uh, a family, a uh, small family. Um, uh, actually, uh, both of my parents were the only uh, child. So I didn't have like uh, a lot of uncles and aunts, and so uh, in that sense, uh, I had a very small family. And uh, my uh, parents uh, were uh, Christian, and uh, <clears throat> my uh, father, uh, he was raised in the Catholic Church. And my mother was raised in the Baptist Church. <clears throat> so I became uh, uh, kind of, uh, <clears throat> my background in growing up, for instance, was that uh, I was uh, <clears throat> born in 1955, and I think I came of age uh, <clears throat> in the time of the Vietnam War. So. I spent uh, my youth uh, watching this uh, Vietnam War on television, the news and newsreels and these types of things. So I think that uh, made a very uh, big impact on my worldview and uh, gave me some um, idea about, uh, uh, which was beneficial for me uh, down the road to think about um, the uh, oppressed people and all of the uh, situations in the in the world, and as it relates to oppressed people. But I think the, this whole Vietnam War, um, it kind of showed uh, the American uh, kind of uh, treachery. Uh, for instance, uh, the major figures in the Vietnam War, for instance Ho Chi Minh, they uh, originally were getting support from the United States. But the United States uh, changed up on them, meaning that they couldn't, uh, they, they found that they couldn't use them because uh, they were strong nationalists in the beginning and uh, then they became communists. So again, the communists is, uh, you know, communism is a red flag. So <clears throat> they switched and uh, <clears throat> I think one thing that uh, was very important that the uh, United States was very, um, they were supposed to have an election. Uh, and Ho Chi Minh would have actually won this election. So uh, they actually did not have this election. And this election actually would have unified Vietnam. And um, so, Vietnam uh, actually evolved into two states. So that was something uh, which was uh, very important uh, in giving me a world view. But I did a lot of reading and, um, you know, I uh, <clears throat> looked at the struggles of many different uh, countries, uh, you know, and uh, many different nations. So. Um, I had, from that perspective, a good uh, um, education in, in terms of uh, my worldview. I had uh, uh, two brothers and one sister. And uh, so my sister, unfortunately, she died in a, an accident. Uh, so that was a very uh, difficult time. Um, I think... Uh, I had maybe been a, a Muslim uh, a short uh, period of time, maybe about uh, five or six years. So that was really one of the most difficult times uh, in my life, you know, to uh, experience that, you know. So, <clears throat> uh, so I had uh, also a brother, he was actually my uh, half-brother, and uh, he lived, he grew up in New York City, because my father was from New York City. So uh, he was uh, a uh, 
kind of different personality than the rest of us, you know. So he was the, the one who got in trouble a lot. Uh, so uh, a fortunate thing was that uh, he seemed to be the person that always uh, got caught. Uh, and, uh, you know, so he had a difficult life from that point of view. And then I had another brother, um, so this, this uh, brother, this was well, the oldest brother, he's also deceased. So my, uh, my only uh, living brother uh, is uh, still living in New York. So he's my older brother, maybe about five years. Uh, my father wasn't really very uh, strong, but uh, my mother and my grandmother were very, very uh, strong Christians. We uh, actually, because by virtue of the fact that my father uh, was Catholic, so we went to the Catholic Church. And uh, so, for instance, my grandmother always blamed my mother that uh, if uh, they hadn't uh, sent me to the, the Catholic Church, then um, maybe uh, even I wouldn't have become a Muslim. So that was like, uh, for instance, in their view, that was my downfall. They have this, what they call catechism classes in the Catholic Church. But I really didn't enjoy the Catholic Church at all. It was really kind of a um, spooky type of uh, environment. Uh, didn't enjoy it. It was very formal. And um, <clears throat> I think the Catholic uh, Church has changed a lot uh, since the time when I was in the Catholic Church. Uh, so they, you, they used to have this, uh, what they call, confessional. And uh, so you will go to the priest and you're supposed to say, you know, you, so, you say, uh, forgive me, Father, I have sinned, so it has been such and such a time since my last, last confession. And then you, sh you go about uh, telling him what uh, sins that you have committed. I, 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 I didn't like that whole system at well. Actually, I enjoyed my mother's church because uh, it was lively, it was vibrant. Uh, so that was a totally different experience than the Catholic Church. Well, um, I never really um, uh, talked to any minister or anything like that. I mostly got my uh, understanding from my religion from my parents and like my, my uh, mother and my grandmother. So um, I think that was uh, my religious upbringing. Uh, meaning this uh, idea of uh, being religious was uh, always something that uh, was uh, a part of my life, meaning that uh, I uh, always aspire to be conscientious and, and religious. Okay. So I think that um, that was something which I, I would attribute to my, uh, my parents. Well, as a child, uh, for instance, I just uh, didn't really, uh, things didn't click uh, from the side of the Catholic Church. And uh, so it wasn't really a very uh, good experience in my view. Uh, and so w I think I learned more uh, about Christianity from, the, from, the, this, uh, from my mother's church. So that's, uh, that gave me a, a, a better understanding. Then I had some uh, relatives. I, I remember like uh, when I was um, uh, in high school, uh, I had a relative who was actually a Methodist. And so the Methodists, they don't believe in this trinity. So we, uh, on many occasions, we would sit and we would talk uh, about this concept of the trinity. And um, because, again, the, um, most of the Christians, they don't question this idea of the trinity. But uh, now I'm, I'm seeing someone who didn't accept this this concept of the Trinity at all. So that was uh, very kind of liberating for me, to see someone who didn't have the same view as others. So I um, <clears throat> basically went to my neighborhood school in, uh, uh, up to uh, um, uh, junior high. And then I went to a, uh, a Catholic uh, um, a school, <clears throat> which was really a very uh, different experience, and uh, I really even regret 
looking back that I even uh, did that. And actually I didn't finish. Uh, it was actually a Jesuit uh, school, and you know, I don't know if you know about this Jesuit order, but there are a, a, a particular order of uh, Catholics. Um, some of them uh, in the old uh, tradition, they used to even wear the long robes like the, you know, as we wear the Jalabia, so they would wear the, the long uh, robes and these types of things. Some of the younger, uh, these uh, teachers, uh, so they, they took a more modern view. But the really uh, strange experience uh, for me was that, uh, first of all, uh, I have to say, uh, honestly, I never saw so many uh, homosexuals in one place in my life. It was really uh, a very uh, uh, sad thing for me. And um, <clears throat> it was very difficult for me to uh, to deal with that. And also, um, I didn't really fit in. I was, there was only maybe about, uh, um, I think, uh, four or five uh, African Americans. Uh, so, uh, I really didn't uh, feel that I, I really fit in in that environment. And uh, I also had a lot of uh, uh, problems, uh, you know, um, you know, I was a young adult, so you know, um, one of the problems that I had was that, uh, you know, I'm growing a, a mustache, for instance, so they said that you have to shave your mustache. So I felt, you know, you know I'm waiting all my life for this mustache, right? So <laughs> now they're telling me that I have to give it up. So I felt that that was really uh, too much to ask. You know, so, I mean, because I also was growing, uh, you know, I mean, I was only like uh, 16 years old, but I was also starting to get hair on my chin, so I didn't mind cutting that out, but the mustache I wasn't going to give up. So, uh, that's uh, part of a, a, a young person's identity. And uh, so, the other thing is that we had to wear a, uh, a tie, you know, a shirt and tie. Uh, so. That also didn't sit very well with me, uh, so uh, um, consequently I was in the office a lot. Well, I did. Uh, first of all, you know, um, uh, my, um, I talked with my mother about it, uh, for instance, and um, I remember uh, the day that I left. Uh, and this was actually a very uh, sad day because uh, there was a, a rebellion in a prison in Attica, New York. So uh, <clears throat> we were kind of uh, aware of this, uh, this uh, particular prison and because uh, it's uh, actually uh, only about, um, you know, maybe a half hour drive from Buffalo. Uh, this particular prison, and there was a rebellion, which they called the police, the state police, in, and they put this rebellion down very uh, brutally. So a lot of people were killed, uh, even some of the guards were killed, uh, and it, it became a, a, a very, uh, um, also a very tragic thing, which is kind of left an impact. Uh, this brutality uh, from the state, actually. So it was something, uh, uh, on that particular day, I heard the news about this, uh, this uprising in, the, in Attica prison. So that was uh, uh, very sad, but um, I went on and I uh, just uh, after that went to regular uh, high school. Uh, about, um, meaning uh, I converted about uh, 19. There was one uh, young lady who was kind of uh, attached to my family. So that was um, basically the exposure that I had to Islam. And uh, she was uh, someone who uh, kind of uh, guided me and, uh, you know, uh, warned me that uh, what, uh, what group you should, you know, be inclined toward and what group you should stay away from. Uh, so there were a lot of different uh, uh, groups meaning that uh, there was, like for instance, among African Americans, there was the Nation of Islam. Uh, there was um, 
uh, another group uh, who were Sunnis, and uh, she belonged to this particular group. So she uh, also warned me about this particular group, that the imam, for instance, uh, she told me about this particular imam and what his shortcomings were. So she was very honest with me and very frank with me. And I think the only reason that she stayed with them was because she had long ties with this particular group. Uh, and so they, they were kind of insulated against uh, all these other groups. So, but eventually I, I went to the uh, Ahasunna. And uh, that uh, was, uh, again, um, something which uh, I, I think I, probably for about uh, four or five years, I really wasn't very uh, solid in Islam meaning I was kind of wavering and uh, trying to find myself, so to speak. And uh, <clears throat> then uh, uh, I, I became a little bit more practicing and became a little bit more uh, involved in the mosque and these types of things. So actually I moved uh, very close to the mosque, so I attended the uh, prayers and these types of things uh, very frequently. So that would, it became a, a habit for me to uh, frequent mosque. So I think that was the time, uh, and so maybe that was maybe about uh, five years after I converted. She actually uh, gave me some idea about what are the fundamental principles of Islam. You know, this uh, Tawheed and the Buat and these types of things. So it introduced me to books which I could read uh, these uh, concepts. So. Uh, but again, these were um, from the perspective of Ahlul Sunnah. And uh, so from that point of view, those things weren't really different um, uh, from um, uh, what Shias believe, fundamentally different. Mm, there are some differences, but not fundamentally. Like I say, uh, I was uh, uh, probably a... Um, at the time, I was uh, maybe about uh, 25, I became a little bit more, um, uh, I could say, uh, solid in, in my practice and understanding about Islam. I wanted to learn more. And so I, w I moved uh, close to the masjid, uh, walking distance from the masjid. And uh, so I started studying there. And uh, so I started, um, I had a, a two teachers, for instance, um, uh, one was teaching me a recitation of Quran, and one was uh, teaching me uh, uh, Arabic, and both of them were uh, Egyptians. And uh, so, um, that uh, process actually went on for probably about another five years, uh, learning and, and studying uh, and uh, so uh, I think uh, my um, introduction to the Shia faith, uh, we were in the masjid, and Sunnis and Shias were all, we only had one masjid at that particular time. So Sunnis and Shias, we were all uh, in this uh, masjid together. So uh, one day, uh, a Shia brother asked me, uh, that he said that we are reciting this uh, du'a uh, of uh, Imam Ali. And so, you know, my name, I changed my name uh, to Ali. So I was very much impressed, uh, more than any uh, other person, with the, the personality of Imam Ali. And uh, so, you know, when he said that this is the, the du'a of Imam Ali, so um, I was uh, wanting to see. Uh, about this. And of course, uh, at that particular time, I wasn't really, uh, really very well uh, versed in Arabic. I could read Arabic, but uh, I, I couldn't uh, understand Arabic. Okay. But um, I was very much impressed uh, with these uh, young brothers. And most of them, there was a collection of uh, uh, Iranis, uh, Iraqis, uh, and a few Lebanese. And uh, so, 
uh, one of the things in, which I observed from them, which I didn't see from other Sunnis, was that uh, they were very, very knowledgeable as compared to other people. Meaning that uh, m mostly the, uh, the other Sunni brothers were more ritualistic. Meaning that they, they came and they prayed uh, and uh, so for them that was the, the uh, <clears throat> the really uh, big part of their religion, just to pray. But uh, with the Shias, for instance, uh, they had a, a, a deeper spiritual side, uh, which I found refreshing, you know. And uh, so I, I would, uh, you know, listen to this uh, Dua Komel, and you know, the Iranis uh, in, uh, in, in particular, and they have a habit that they will cut out, cut down the lights, and um, you know, so that uh, they don't feel embarrassed to cry or something like that. So that was a new uh, experience for me to see that type of uh, emotional, um, you know, uh, outp outpouring of uh, this uh, emotion. So that was very uh, uh, have a, a very deep impact on me. That uh, to see this type of uh, uh, e emotion, because I hadn't seen it uh, before. So uh, other people, Sunnis, my Sunni friends were just very straightforward, you know, uh, very uh, methodical about things, and um, uh, there was really no emotion about uh, religion. But I found a lot of emotion uh, with these uh, Shia brothers. So that was something which was uh, very, um, had a very strong impact on me. And I kind of gravitated toward those brothers. Uh, then I think uh, what happened was, um, <clears throat> like what happened in many places, is that the, um, this Wahhabism started to surface. And uh, for instance, there was a particular uh, individual who came from Saudi Arabia, like they sent uh, many of their, uh, they were actually trained in Saudi Arabia, so they came to work in the United States. And uh, so once the, that uh, individual came, I saw that things started to change. Meaning that, uh, for instance, uh, we couldn't do this dual kamel in the masjid anymore. Right, so we had to shift and, and do this uh, in someone's home. And, and actually, this Dua Kamil was actually one of the longest running uh, programs that was going on in this masjid, outside of the you know, Jamaat prayer itself. Uh, so this was uh, one of the longest running uh, uh, programs which was uh, going on at that particular time. And uh, so that was very disturbing that this you know, these people, they complain uh, about Shias. And uh, so prior to that particular time, the issue of Sunni and Shia wasn't really important. You know, so meaning that uh, we didn't really uh, feel any um, uh, bias or anything like that. And uh, so the Sunni brothers didn't express any, um, any negativity towards Shias. But this is something which gradually came about. Uh, for instance, there were uh, people who were uh, praying with their hands down because they were, they were from the Maliki school, for instance. So these brothers started telling these, uh, these brothers, don't pray like this, you know, because you'll be mixed up with Shias, meaning that you'll be confused that, uh, that you, you are Shias. So these weren't uh, things which uh, most Sunnis cared about. You know, but these things became more and more important uh, after these uh, Wahhabi show up, and uh, so that that uh, I, I saw a, uh, a gradual um, change uh, and change in individuals' behavior, uh, change in the attitudes uh, toward the Shia faith in, in general. So. Uh, again, we had to uh, leave the, uh, this Dua Kamel and do it in an individual's house. So, 
uh, that was uh, something which was uh, kind of uh, disturbing. That uh, there was really, uh, I mean, the, 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 re the reason for it, uh, again, was just that uh, this particular individual who came, uh, he uh, started to insist, because th they were linked to money. Meaning, so the Saudis are always uh, putting pressure uh, to change things, meaning that whatever they want, uh, they get their way. So they, because they're giving money, right? So they are able to influence the board and, and influence decisions and uh, because they're uh, contributing uh, a lot of money to the centers. So they have a lot of influence from that point of view. And so they get what they want, unfortunately. Well, I think one time I heard this, uh, uh, someone was uh, making mention of this, uh, this uh, Hadith of Thakalayim. And uh, so the people of Ahl Sunnah, they say that this Hadith of Thakalayim are the two things, are the Quran and they say the Sunnah. So there was one uh, brother, uh, his name was Mahmoud, uh, a Palestinian brother. So uh, he told me, uh, to, you know, to myself, and I don't think that he would have repeated this to, to other people, but he told me, because he saw that I was having some connection with the Shia brothers. So he said that uh, this is the way that they translate it. He said, but this isn't what it means. So I said, well, what does it mean? So he said that uh, it is not saying the, anything about, uh, you know, the, uh, the Sunnah. He said that it says that uh, the, the, the two weighty things are the Quran and uh, my Ahl Bayt. And uh, so um, that uh, was like an eye opener for me. You know, that uh, first of all, uh, I was kind of um, uh, depressed that uh, this. Hadith had been, which is an important hadith, had been mistranslated. And why had it been mistranslated? So, um, <clears throat> you know, I mean, I, I pondered over this and, and, and thought about this and asked people about this. And uh, so I came up with a lot of different uh, reasons when asking different people, you know, so that why uh, they're saying the, the Sunnah instead of the Ahlul Bayt, you know. And of course, uh, when you ask a Sunni this question, so you get the, a predictable answer. And you ask a Shia the question, then you get uh, the, a, a, another uh, predictable answer. Uh, but that predictable answer is a much clearer answer uh, um, and um, something which is uh, making more sense. Um, I think, uh, Again, uh, I started studying with uh, Shia brothers, started studying uh, Arabic grammar with uh, one of the Iraqi brothers. And uh, actually, they gave me an application uh, to Qum. And, but I didn't feel I was prepared to, to make that, uh, that shift and go to Qum, you know. So, and then uh, maybe about uh, uh, two years later, uh, I heard about this school opening up in Medina. And Medina from Buffalo was about 45 miles. So for me, uh, and we used to go to this actually, to this center, uh, this Islamic center in Medina. And uh, so uh, they are the ones who actually uh, started this house. And uh, so that was a much uh, better uh, opportunity for me, you know, so uh, rather than going all, you know, in a overseas and, and this type of thing. So um, <clears throat> I prepared myself, uh, I, I talked to the, the individuals at the school, and um, they had a little uh, problem uh, uh, starting up initially, but uh, after a, uh, a couple of years, uh, they started up. Now the problem that I had was at that time I was 30 years old. Okay, so 
they were actually uh, looking for uh, much younger students. So they, there was a, a question about whether uh, I would be uh, accepted or not. So, but uh, they came to the conclusion that first of all they knew me, I had been coming to the center for many years, uh, and uh, so uh, based on that uh, they accepted me. And uh, so that was uh, the start of uh, How's the Life, and that was in uh, uh, 1985. And so I started uh, studying. In the first year, uh, we really uh, didn't have a... Um, uh, it wasn't really like a, a house. The person who had uh, actually started the school, his uh, vision, uh, because he was actually from Pakistan, so his vision was um, basically uh, to create a, a Zakir school, which I would say, meaning that uh, you would uh, just uh, uh, learn to uh, give majalis and these types of things. You rem remem memorize some uh, ayat of Quran, some hadith, and you sit on the member. So uh, that uh, lasted for a year. We had three teachers uh, in that year. And um, then uh, in the second year, uh, my teacher came uh, from Iran. Um, he was actually from Pakistan. So his teacher actually uh, came to Iran and, and told him uh, in the first year that uh, a, a new house is opening up in Iran and uh, we'd like you to go and uh, teach there. So he was actually studying, uh, he was doing his Das al Kharaj with uh, Ayatollah Nasim Karim. And so he, he told him, uh, uh, his name was um, uh, Safdar Hussein Marhum. Uh, he was uh, a person who had started uh, probably uh, over 40 uh, houses in different cities in Pakistan. So he was. Uh, you know, had done a lot of work in Pakistan in establishing these houses. So he, uh, uh, my teacher told him that, okay, I just got married and that it would be very difficult for me to, to leave uh, in this situation that I'm, you know, just having been married. So his teacher said, okay. So he uh, went back and he came back the next year. And uh, so uh, in the next year now, uh, he asked him again that uh, you, you're ready to go to, uh, uh, to the United States. And uh, he didn't really want to come to the United States, you know, because again, he was doing Dasa Cottage. And uh, so coming to, I mean, uh, it's a, on one hand, it's a, an opportunity, but on the other hand, it's the United States. And this is something new, it's something uh, which has uh, really never been tried before. So it wasn't really a very attractive idea to him. And uh, so he again tried to make an excuse. And uh, so his teacher told him that so if you don't want to go to the United States, then we can uh, send you to uh, Bangladesh. So I guess Bangladesh was like going to the uh, like the, the worst place in the world, you know, so he gave him a choice. You go to the worst place in the world or you can go to the second worst place, meaning America. So he said, okay, he will go to America. And uh, so he came and actually he was the one who set the house on this right course, uh, meaning he established the house according to the syllabus which was being used in Kong and uh, according to the courses and uh, uh, subject, subjects which are being taught in Kung. So he's the one who actually uh, put things in the right footing. And uh, so I, I really uh, owe everything to him. Uh, his name was um, uh, Sheikh uh, Amir Mukhtar Faizi. And uh, he's now living in um, um, Chicago. So um, I graduated from, uh, after four years, I graduated. Uh, and uh, I went to Iran for a short period of time, but uh, at that particular time I was teaching, uh, helping uh, Sheikh Faizi, because I hadn't learned Arabic, so I was helping him uh, teach, and 
because again, um, uh, <clears throat> we were mostly dealing with American students. And uh, so he uh, had some, um, meaning he is, his English was uh, pr pr pretty good, but again, uh, he had some problems uh, actually understanding the culture uh, of Americans and, uh, you know, so uh, he, he, I think he needed someone like myself who was familiar with uh, American culture and could uh, guide him uh, a little bit better. So anyway, uh, uh, I went back after about uh, six months in Iran to help him uh, uh, continue teaching. So I continued uh, teaching for six years, um, and uh, the Hausa altogether lasted ten years in, uh, in Medina. No, that was, um, that was actually the Hausa uh, uh, closed down, uh, and uh, so I was... Uh, while I was in the house, actually, I started uh, thinking about what I wanted to what I wanted to do next because I knew that uh, this house wouldn't last forever. So I started doing some uh, studying and training, and so I actually um, got an IT job. I got a I took a course uh, for um, uh, networking, like a, a, a CNA. Uh, so. I passed that test, and so I started working um, uh, as a, um, you know, a, a network manager. So I did that uh, for uh, probably about uh, five or six years, uh, and um, then I heard about uh, this uh, school here uh, in in, um, in Florida. My mother really didn't. Uh, I mean, she was uh, supportive. You know, and my mother, my grandmother, she was just kind of old school, you know, so, uh, and she, she made once a, a comment, she, uh, I had told her that I was going to become a Muslim, so she said, oh, don't bother with those people, those people are crazy. <laughs> so, uh, and you know, again, um, just not knowing anything about Islam, because again, uh, at that particular time, we're talking about, uh, you know, um, in the uh, 80s. So uh, Islam wasn't on the map for most people in America, you know. And uh, so, but I, I would have to say that uh, I really didn't have any problem uh, from my parents. At that particular time, uh, for instance, my sister, uh, she was deceased. My uh, brother, shortly after that, was also deceased. So it was only my uh, oldest brother. And uh, he was also also very uh, receptive, and um, he also uh, did a little uh, studying uh, about Islam himself. Um, but then, um, I would say overall, I didn't find any uh, resistance from any of uh, any strong resistance from any uh, member of my family. So I was lucky in that regard. And again, also, uh, from my uh, friends, I didn't really, uh, m maybe mm, some friends uh, stopped associating with me, um, but I didn't really, uh, I can't really say that I lost uh, any uh, 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 real important friends, because we had, uh, for the friends which I uh, had a really strong contact with, we maintained this contact. And, you know, so I can't really say I lost those uh, friends. I, some I do stay in contact with, mostly the uh, uh, African-American brothers. So for African-American brothers, this issue of Sunni and Shia wasn't really strong and it wasn't really important. Uh, so their, their concern was mostly about are you a Muslim or not. You know, Shia and Sunni wasn't really uh, very... Uh, important for them. So the issue is Islam for, for most of them. Now some of the, uh, like some of the uh, other brothers, uh, meaning Arabs and uh, Pakistanis and, and these types of brothers, maybe uh, some of them became a little bit more distant, you know, but I can't really say that uh, um, I, I uh, outwardly just lost friends. You know, 
but um, maybe some of them they just kind of uh, backed away a little bit, you know. Of course, it depends on the center, and uh, so uh, the most challenging thing usually is language. You know, uh, even the center that I was in, the, so the people were uh, basically Indian Pakistani, uh, so. Like for instance, the the Arabs and the Iranis were a minority, so mostly the people were Urdu-speaking people. So that was uh, probably for me um, that was the most challenging thing. I didn't really. Uh, I, I mean, uh, sometimes there was some uh, issues, uh, but I kind of uh, learned to deal. Uh, with these uh, type of issues, you know. I mean, I didn't let them, these type of issues bother me. Well, the most important thing is that um, they should start to study, meaning and learn about Islam. Uh, so I think that when you uh, are thinking about uh, making this uh, transition to Islam, you need to prepare yourself. And you prepare yourself by uh, reading. You know, you and you have to, and again, the problem is, uh, our problem as uh, Shias is that we don't have a lot of uh, literature uh, compared to the people of Ahlul Sunnah. They have all of their, you know, their Hadith books and, and these types of things in, in English. Uh, so we are so far behind. Uh, so this is a, a problem which we face, you know, as Shias, to try to uh, bridge this gap. You know, and uh, we are just uh, really, uh, meaning I, I was using, like for instance, the Yusuf Ali, a uh, Quran, you know, from most of the time, uh, even when I was Shia. You know, so uh, only recently uh, did I find a, a, a translation by a Shia author. You know, so this is the big problem that we have, and again, we want to look at our hadith and things like that, so most of these hadith are in Arabic. To study uh, and um, to uh, try to be uh, a little bit more uh, spiritually inclined, meaning because uh, Islam is not uh, just a, a ritualistic uh, religion, you have to have some, um, you know, spirituality. Uh, so I think that's the second port and most important thing, is that uh, you have to elevate your level of uh, spirituality. And uh, so you, you have to read, uh, you have to learn, and you have to practice. And so <clears throat> all of these things uh, combined uh, will help you to, uh, uh, you know, um, make a smoother transition. So if you leave these things out, meaning that if you don't study uh, properly, you don't, you're not really committed to studying, uh, or if you're not really committed to spirituality, so there will be uh, some shortcomings in your ability to make this transition. So that's uh, the most um, important thing. And um, I think also uh, a person has to pay attention to language, because that's uh, very important. You don't, you don't go anywhere in Islam without paying attention to language. So, uh, if you are, uh, for instance, an English-speaking person, so you need to learn Arabic, you know. And uh, if you are speaking another language, uh, you still need to learn Arabic. So, it might be easier to make a transition from a, a, a second language, you know, uh, to Arabic if you already have mastered uh, like uh, some other type of language, you know. So that maybe in, uh, in those languages, maybe there is a, uh, a, a wealth of information in, uh, about Arabic, okay. But uh, that would be the third thing, is that you need to begin your study of Arabic, you know, and need to start thinking about it. And uh, these are these are things that you you have to take really very seriously, you know. Meaning this uh, study uh, and this uh, spiritualism and uh, language. So these are three things that uh, you you won't really uh, be very successful 
without paying attention to these three things? Well, I think uh, from, from myself, for instance, one of the things that uh, convinced me is just talking to uh, Sunnis, meaning that uh, because the, they have a very strong reliance on a hadith, and uh, so the, the big problem, uh, they have a, a too strong of a reliance on hadith, and at the same time, they have a, uh, a, a very weak type of logic. Okay, so meaning that they're sometimes too accepting of hadith. Hadith which are uh, clearly, uh, you know, uh, problematic or, you know, uh, clearly false. You know, like for instance, uh, uh, I remember reading, um, <clears throat> of course this is uh, narrated by our friend Abu Harera. He says that uh, Allah, He created uh, man and son in his own image. Now, uh, actually, this is actually taken from the Bible. All right? So, and it is, from our perspective, it's totally untrue because we don't have an image of God. All right? So, uh, the, the Christian image of God is this image of Jesus. So, this is their God. And again, uh, their image of, uh, of Jesus has been, uh, you can say, uh, literally whitewashed. Meaning that, uh, you know, uh, Jesus was a Palestinian, and uh, so they have uh, made Jesus like he had just came from the middle of Europe. You know, so a Palestinian, uh, they, you know, it says in the, in, in the Bible, that he had olive-colored skin, and he had curly hair. And uh, so, but mm, that's not what you see in the portrait of Jesus. So they, they actually literally changed this, you know. And uh, so they made, them, they made this picture of, uh, uh, of Jesus like themselves, you know. So, uh, when, uh, when they say, for instance, that, okay, uh, God made man in his own image, so this is the image which they're thinking about, you know, and this is the, uh, something which, you know, uh, so I, I can't understand, to, to make the long story short, I can't understand why Muslims would even accept this hadith, even if they didn't know that this is uh, coming from the Bible. All right, so because there's no logic. So just a blind reliance on hadith uh, is something which is very dangerous, you know. And um, so an another hadith, for instance, uh, like you'll, you'll see in, uh, in Quran about the description for wudu. Okay, you, you wash the, uh, the face and the hands and you wipe the head and the feet. Okay. But Sunnis do something different, you know. So they wash the uh, the, 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 the the face uh, and the hands, and then they uh, wipe the head and they wash the feet. So this is all based on the hadith, which was narrated by the servant of Uthman. And so they observed him doing this, and. Uh, they accepted this. So why did they accept this when uh, it is clearly uh, contradicting Quran? And Sunnis themselves, they have a hadith that if you find something contradicting the Quran, they say, throw it against the wall, meaning reject it. But why didn't they reject that? And again, that's a very important hadith uh, because uh, it is actually you know, uh, when you contradict in the, the Quran, especially when we're talking about uh, purification. So this is very important. So uh, the implications of that is uh, mind-boggling. <clears throat> Again, uh, uh, they can't find the answer in their, in their own madhab. Okay, they, you know, that was the problem which I had. 
in the, in the Sunni madhab, they don't have uh, answers to these problems. So uh, Shias have answers to these problems. Uh, so um, the reality is then that, uh, of course, it's not easy for someone who is a Sunni, for instance, to make this transition. Now, because we were converts, it is easier for us to make a transition. But when you see that someone has been raised on this tradition uh, all of their life, they have believed in this, uh, so then it's not easy to walk away from. All right? So you don't see uh, any conversion of, uh, amongst people who were born Muslim. Okay, but uh, a, a convert uh, has a, uh, a different uh, point of view, meaning that uh, a convert is always looking uh, for answers. So many of the people who have been born Muslim, they already think they have an answer. They already think they know what is the solution and what is the, uh, what, what problems they face and what are the answers for those problems. So, but the, a convert is looking more for answers, always looking for answers. And that, that's a very good quality. You know, that you're always searching and always looking for answers. And uh, sometimes that is the thing that has, uh, you know, led most of us to, to change, uh, even after we were uh, Sunni. Uh, so this uh, idea in our minds that there was something missing, you know, uh, and that caused us to, to, to keep looking, to keep uh, searching, and to keep asking questions. So that's a very good uh, uh, quality, I think, that most converts have. Well, uh, I would just like to say then that uh, I uh, hope that uh, whomever um, listens to this and uh, hears this uh, uh, video uh, will give some uh, serious uh, thought uh, about Islam. Uh, even if uh, they are Muslim or non-Muslim, that uh, you have to give um, particular thought, for instance, to your own self, uh, your own uh, practice of Islam, and you have to always try to improve yourself. Uh, that's the most important thing, that uh, we, uh, we can't become stagnant as Muslims. You know, you have to always try to better and improve yourself. And uh, so uh, once we uh, lose that uh, desire to improve ourselves, then we are just like uh, dead on this earth. And uh, so I would always advise, advise people that uh, you have to uh, study your religion, you have to practice your religion, you have to try to uh, improve yourself, you know, and be critical of yourself. Uh, <clears throat> take uh, a stock of your uh, actions, you know, look at yourself uh, objectively as you can and, and get advice from other people also that uh, how you can improve yourself. Uh, and that's something which is uh, very important. You have to, you, you know, you have to remain critical. You can't uh, just be accepting uh, that uh, I'm doing good, okay, uh, because most of the time, that isn't really uh, a correct perspective. Uh, we're not really doing good, you know. So we may think that we're doing good, uh, but uh, we can sometimes, uh, with the help of shaitan, uh, we can convince ourselves of many, uh, many strange things. So uh, my advice is that uh, you have to struggle uh, with Islam, you know, and don't take it uh, for granted that uh, you have to um, be involved and you have to work for Islam and uh, try to uh, change yourself and then change the people who are around you. And um, if you can make some progress toward those goals, then I think, uh, you know, we all will become uh, better Muslims.